In our gospel passage today, John refers to the commandments of Jesus. The commandments that Jesus gives are few and far between, in a sense. He wasn't big on do's and don'ts. Nevertheless, John's writing makes it clear that by commandments, Jesus is incorporating all that he is, all that he has taught his listeners, all that he has been for his listeners. More than once, Jesus has emphasised the need for his followers to be faithful to his word. And in John's hand, Jesus himself is word. And Jesus now, for the first time, names the paraclete spirit in that strange way. Advocate, helper, guide, and so much more. All wrapped up in a strange title and strange new experience of the Trinity of God, whose task is to be Christ within us and around us. It is safe to say then that to keep the commandments of Jesus is by the help of this paraclete spirit who is holiness and to whom from now Jesus begins to refer frequently. To keep the commandments of Jesus is to be immersed in and embody all that Jesus is and teaches. The holiness of the spirit making the holiness of Jesus present to us. In his writings, Paul uses the phrase, Christ and him crucified, and he means something similar. The life, teachings, behaviour, death, resurrection and future judgement are all incorporated into these phrases of John and Paul. Jesus and all that he is, Son of God. When speaking about the doctrine of salvation, I will often refer to the work of the cross in what we call universalist terms. The salvation work of God in Christ moving onwards until the number of those unwilling freely to accept God's love is zero. But that's not to, to relativise all religions and all religious viewpoints, as if behind every viewpoint there is some sort of unity of which all faiths are a weak replica. Nor is it to reduce Jesus to a one amongst many holy man and moral teacher. Paul, at least in Luke's renditions of him in the Areopagus speech from Acts, and I suspect that's close indeed to Paul, the public speaker, Paul is able to associate the God of the cross with the God of countless faith. But in his hands, it's not relativism. All religions lead to God, so pick and choose to suit. No, God in Christ leads to God. But God in Christ will honour and reach out to every being who prays, who seeks, who longs for the love touch of the divine. As Jesus promises the coming advocate, paraclete spirit, he makes it clear that the insight that comes by faith in Jesus and the commandments of Jesus, faith in the whole being and teaching of Jesus, is a prerequisite to the experience of God's pneuma, God's spirit. That spirit transforms, electrifies our own spiritual lives, reforms us in what theologian Jürgen Moltmann might call cruciform shape. She reforms us with the hope-filled, love-filled, joy-filled, compassion and justice-filled essence of God. Reforms us in the likeness of Christ, the likeness and the holiness of God for us. The Orthodox speak of divinization, and if I understand that remotely aright, it's that slow, spirit-filled transformation of us into the image of God for which we were originally created. The paraclete spirit also teaches us to pray. She can turn empty recitations and incantations into the language of heaven, if we let her. And by this I do not 
refer to the phenomenon known as glossolalia or speaking in tongues. That too can either be an empty incantation or an offering of prayer. Only the tuning, we might even say the attunement of the praying person's heart can decide what it is. Am I open to the cruciform spirit of God as I read ancient prayers? Am I open to the cruciform spirit of God as I speak or sing in tongues? Am I open to the cruciform spirit of God as I stutter my heartache? God knows my prayer life to be impoverished enough. I find many ways to block out the promptings of God's spirit. And yet we can open ourselves, by the undiscipline that I undoubtedly lack, to that power of prayer. The psalmist gasps, blessed be God, because God has not rejected my prayer or removed divine steadfast love from me. The psalmist can do that because she or he is so filled with God's spirit that she both acknowledges her fallibility and God's plugging of the gaps and enrichment of her spiritual life. Our best liturgies take us on a journey from unrelatedness to God, unrelatedness to God, to relatedness to God. As our prayers can move from hollow incantations or meaningless gibber to spirit-inflamed connection with God. Our lives, too, are liturgy, journeying as we let them from the stumblings of hollow men and women to the resuscitation of the spirit. And so it is that Jesus declares we are not orphaned. We can choose to remain as if orphaned, alone and friendless on a tiny blimp in an infinite universe. Or we can surrender our lives to the spirit who breathes beauty and life into that universe, beauty and life into our lives, beauty and life into the existence of the forsaken and the lonely and the broken individuals and species and even, yes, all who we reach out and touch. God's new heaven and a new earth is something to do with that promise. We will celebrate the Spirit's coming at Pentecost. But she comes and she has come even before creation, blowing through a thousand paddocks, and even the paddocks of our lives, if we let her, infesting us with Jesus. Dare we let her? Come, Holy Spirit, come, infest us with the cruciform life of Jesus. Come, Holy Spirit, come.